you have your Bibles, join me in Luke chapter 2. And I'd like us to read one of the most detailed accounts of the birth of our Savior. And we find it all squeezed into two verses. Verses 6 and 7 of Luke chapter 2. I just want you to take note of all the detail this gives us. And while they, we have to substitute Mary and Joseph, were there in Bethlehem, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Got any other questions? <laughs> I mean, that's one of the most detailed accounts we have of the birth of Jesus. That's it. But evidently, this is what God has determined that we need to know. No mention of pain here. No mention of emotions, joy, fear, elation, or any sorrow or otherwise. No details about the place where the manger sat. No mention of a cave or a stable or a barn. No mention of blood or sweat or tears. Actually, for all we know, Mary could have given birth to Jesus in a corral behind the inn. Again, God allows us to use our imaginations based on our own experiences and our knowledge of other portions of the scripture to fill in the details. And part of me wonders if the Lord was simply showing them respect by protecting their privacy. I don't know. I imagine I asked myself that question because I remember feeling kind of violated as the hospital corridor outside of Anne's birthing room filled up with friends and relatives after Clint's birth. I was as new at this birthing business and uh, went into it without thinking about anyone except Anne and me. And suddenly there were people all over the place. I didn't even know how to process it all. I never even held a baby before, much less my own. Were all these people a blessing? <laughs> you ever ask yourself questions like that? Is this a blessing? And you're just not quite sure. It kind of seemed like it, but part of me just wanted to be alone with my wife and my firstborn son. The alone time finally came, but it was hours later that night. And I remember finally being alone in a room, and Anne was holding Clint, stroking his head, playing with his fingers and his toes. <laughs> I remember her saying, David, look at his toes. <laughs> and his mouth and his nose. Saying things like, isn't he beautiful? Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> He's kind of shrivelly. <laughs> oh, that's not unusual. What's that big lump on the top of his head? Looks like a cone head. <laughs> she didn't even get mad at me when I said that. She said, yeah, he does. And she smiled. And she ran her fingers gently over his little head and said, the doctors say that will go away. David, our baby is so beautiful. And my young wife continued to stare at her baby. <laughs> with her bloodshot eyes. <laughs> bloodshot because she'd been trying to push that little guy uh, through a place where he wouldn't fit. <laughs> and she tried hard. I was feeling a little bit antsy. So I said, can I get up and get you anything? No, just sit here with us. Just sit here with us. And so it went. This precious time of the living of life. 
If Ann and I had written down our thoughts and conversations, I suppose it would have filled volumes. Anne's memory being what it is, she could still fill volumes today. And some of our conversations will never be shared with anyone other than God himself. They were ours alone. Some of those memories came rushing back as I watched the fourth part in the video series, The Christmas Experience. And I will admit that as I watched Mary's pain and Joseph's helplessness, I was surprised by the emotion that I felt. I'm surprised by the emotion I'm feeling right now, just as I talk about these things. There's something very close to the heart about it all. Anne had tried to give birth for over 20 hours when she finally was wheeled away into surgery and the emergency room doors closed in my face. She was going in for an emergency C-section. In those days, dads were not allowed in. When Cody and Christy was born, I made sure I was qualified. <laughs> Childbirth, to me, personally, seems both beautiful and horrible, and wonderful and terrifying all at once. And for me, the most amazing thing is how the entire atmosphere changes the moment the baby is placed in the arms of the mother. Just, <laughs> it is like an intense and raging battle is suddenly swallowed up by an air of peaceful tranquility. Was that true in Bethlehem? I imagine it was. Perhaps the most important thing we learn from this brief description of the birth of Jesus is what we can conclude from what is not said. We know that Jesus was not born into a wealthy family. He wasn't born into a family with a lot of pull. We know that Jesus was not born into a family with political or social power. We know that Jesus was not born into a family of high social standing. We know that no one seemed to care about him at the time of his birth, or his mother, or his father, probably with the exception of those who were watching from the portals of heaven. No parents, no aunts, no uncles, no nephews, no rabbis. They seem to be alone in the world, with one great exception. God was keenly aware of everything. And God was with them and watching over them, making sure that his son was going to be born as it was prophesied he would. God was always watching over them. And, and this is important, he is always watching over you. I am so grateful that how I feel at any given time is never a determining factor in regards to God's presence in my life. Whether I feel he's there or not doesn't mean that he's not there. It is very important that we understand this. My feelings do not control God. My despair doesn't chase him away. My pain or any desperate situation in which I find myself doesn't make God's presence ebb and flow. It's interesting, this week Steve Higgins spoke to the Mops mothers. How many mothers heard Steve speak? Okay. One. No, I'm just kidding. Moff's mothers are so shy. Uh, Steve and I had laughed at the topic that they gave him. If you know Steve Higgins, they gave him the topic of peace and rest. 
So I saw him on Friday evening, and I asked him how it went. He just looked at me and said, it went great, really went great. And uh, he went on to explain to me how he was able to share with these young mothers that our peace as believers is not dependent on anything that is going on in the world outside of us, but our peace and rest come from the indwelling presence of God. That's where it comes from. God is the constant in our life. It was a great message as he repeated it to me, one that we all need to learn. It reflected Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, which says, God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on God. Changing the words up just a little bit there. Because he trusts in God. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. As I watched Pastor Eidelman on the video series rattle off several examples of situations people face which find them in need of faith, I thought of people in our own midst here at Walnut Hill whose situations seem just as dire and some of them even worse. The loss or the threatened loss of employment or income or reputation or a spouse or a son or a daughter or a friend might be lost to the world, some even lost to death. Where is our hope in these times? Well, we need to remember that thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. One of the, probably one of the most common things I hear at funerals in terms of things that people say to me, say, Pastor, I don't know how people who don't have Christ go through these things. And I tell them, they're usually very good at denial. Or they fall apart. I know a lot of people who just don't go to funerals because they can't handle it or they don't want to. And God's trustworthiness is not temporal, it is eternal, for he is an everlasting rock. Not just a common old everyday rock. He is an everlasting rock, solid, safe, firm beneath our feet. So if the rock is where we belong, how do we get there? How do we step onto the rock? I believe that what I have just told you is true. Everything that I have just said is true, and I believe it with all of my heart. And I know that my saying it and my quoting verses to substantiate this claim doesn't automatically translate into change lives and to change attitudes. It just doesn't. Such change typically comes in time. Even when the truth suddenly dawns on someone, the ability to practice faith often takes more time and the work of obedience. It's a process. The power to change so that we become more and more like Jesus demands that we do what Jesus did, allowing him to guide us in our walk and empower us. And for that to happen, we must trust and obey. <laughs> and that demands humility. That demands humility. Come with me to Philippians chapter 2, would you please? Philippians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Okay? Just find one and follow it. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. And let us see if we can find ourselves in this passage. Or let us see if we can see the good and the narrow way that God has set before us. I'm just going to read through verses 1 through 11, and I'm going to pause as I go through and give commentary as I do. First two verses say, So if there is any encouragement from Christ, any comfort from my love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being the same, being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. You know, in these verses, we see a list of blessings that God freely gives to those who seek him. 
And we draw near to God through Jesus. As we draw near to God through Jesus, we find ourselves being strengthened and encouraged by an awareness of his presence and power. It's kind of a first part of your Christian walk. Suddenly you sense, after God has given you his spirit, a strength that wasn't there before. And suddenly we find comfort in knowing that he loves us regardless of our worthiness. And that comforts us. And we find that his Holy Spirit is willing and able to interact with us and we can actually sense his presence in our lives. Something is different and it's wonderful and it's good. Furthermore, we realize that God has an affection for us that we really never ever ever sensed before. It is tender and it is sympathetic. And we realize that he does understand our every thought, our anxiety, our hurts, our frustrations. And when people in their ignorance are unsympathetic, he cares. And we've stepped into this kingdom of his and we're realizing these blessings that are there. But we better not stop there. Because there's more to it than that. We then begin to realize that the Holy Spirit grants all of these things to all of us who are members of his kingdom. God now wants us to know that our joy is the product, not just of these things, but the unity that we all share with others who are blessed in the same way that we're blessed. For these blessings come from the same mind, the same source, the same heart, tying us inextricably together as one. The same source of love, God's, that allows us to be united with one another like a vast orchestra playing all different parts, but playing together as one, directed by our grand maestro, the Holy Spirit. His mind, his heart, his sensibilities, his passions, bringing us in when our parts need to be played, cutting us off, calling for more, calling for less, making the strings submit to the brass, the brass submitting to the woodwinds, and the percussionist pounding a sustaining rhythm with great power or subdued to the light brush on the surface of a symbol, doing what the director asks us to do. And the Spirit of God directs his symphony, the meta-narrative of heaven. And he calls for our attention. And we wait and we listen every morning when we open our eyes. What is it now? Where do I play? Where do I go? When do I come in? Who do I speak to? Who do I not speak to? And he calls for our excellence as we play for him. And the world listens. When it's bad, the world says, I want nothing to do with that. But when it's beautiful, when it's beautiful, it is so compelling and it draws people to Jesus. And as as we play, our director tells us, Do nothing, verse 3, from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Now, considering this portion of scripture as if we were a member of the grand orchestra, we realize that this is the only way to create beauty and harmony. Musicians who are motivated by selfish ambitions or conceit destroy the intent of the author of the peace and the creator of our salvation. 
Ultimately, everything is from and for and to and about God, the creator and sustainer of all things. And he calls us to himself and he gives us sound and wise counsel and direction. Our director tells us to reflect me, be a part of my grandeur and my beauty. Count the musicians around you more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to the part that you have been called to play, but you must also strive to be keenly aware of the parts that others must play. Work with them so as to enhance what they do. Do not work against each other. All of your parts are important, and the director will let you know when to step up a notch when he wants more. He will also, no doubt, silence you and make you observe the rests. <laughs> Sometimes you'll be playing all by yourself, a solo. These times are critical. Mary and Joseph were playing a duet that night. <laughs> the pressure on you will be intense, but at these times you'll be given an opportunity to shine. Be ready. Fear not, for the orchestral angel will whisper in you, your ear, the Lord is with you. If it helps, Imitate the only perfect musician that ever lived. It is his mind and heart that we have been given. To the degree that all of us in the diversity of our skills and backgrounds and experiences and the knowledge and the wisdom that make us who we are, let one mind control all of us. Verse 5. Have this mind amongst yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. Oh, what a precious gift. Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Everything about Jesus screams of humility. Isn't that interesting? The most powerful person who has had more influence over the world than any other in the history of humanity. His life screamed humility. And what magnifies the significance of his humility is his worthiness of glory. He was worthy of glory. He chose humility. I know I'm a sinner. Nobody ever had to convince me that I am a sinner because I always seem to be fighting this battle backwards. Unlike Jesus, my sinful nature desires and strives for the significance of glory in spite of my unworthiness. Jesus existed in heaven from the beginning. He was with God. He was God. He humbled himself as he set aside this form of glory. And the immortal God took on corruptible flesh. The omnipotent God became as powerless as a newborn infant. The omnipresent God entered into the limits of time and space. The omniscient God entered into an undeveloped human brain in need of patterning and learning. The living word entered into the body of a child who could do nothing but utter unintelligible sounds of a baby. He was born poor. He was born socially disadvantaged. He was born racially despised. He was born hated and despised by a king who was trying to kill him. He was born a threat to the status quo, but yet he brought with him the gift of eternal life, for he would save his people from their sins. This God, most high, would become a servant of the lowliest estate, whose self-imposed humility would produce a life that did nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, 
but in humility counted others more significant than himself. He looked not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So much so that he even died for them, and in doing so, paid the penalty for their sin. A penalty that we all deserve. A penalty from which he has set us free. Amen? That was the great time. There we go. He did this because of his love for us. And he tells us to live the same way. He tells us to live the same way. In coming the way he came, in living the way he lived, in dying the way he died, he took away every excuse we may try to muster for not doing it. He taught us that there is honor in humility. Is that countercultural? He taught us that there is power in humility. Is that countercultural? He taught us that the world has it all wrong and he alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father except through him. He never taught that in, well, it was never taught in any secular institution that I ever intended, attended in my life that humility brings honor, humility brings power, that Jesus alone saves. Not my studies in the disciplines of history or sciences or mathematics or the arts, none of those. In those institutions, I learned to value wealth and power and social status and buying power and union solidarity and political prowess and formal education and physical beauty. That's what the world offered me. The world makes big promises, lots of promises, but in the end, what do we have from the world? We have the world. <laughs> Temporal things, lots of stuff that wears out and breaks. <laughs> Relationships that flare up and then fizzle out. Peace that ends in war. Reassurances that end in disappointments. Jesus made even bigger promises. And I prefer his. But in the end, what did Jesus have? Verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. This is what was wrought through the humility of our Lord Jesus. What does that mean to you and I? You and me. Sometimes my dad just reaches out from the grave and slaps me. <laughs> you and me. It means that every promise he gave is true. Everyone. It means that he does indeed have the power to save. Power over life, power over death. Power over heaven, power over hell. Power to redeem humble, broken, hungry souls. Turning them into powerful, restored, filled, beautiful, eternal kingdom children. That's our God. Amen? Stand with me, would you please? Heavenly Father, it is not your will that any should perish without you and join the evil one in the fires of hell. You would gather all people unto yourself. And Lord, we can only come to you through faith. Lord, I pray for anyone here who has never given their heart to you through Jesus, that today would be the day of their salvation. 
a commitment made, a desire stated. Father, forgive me of my sins. Father, make me yours. I give my life to you. I trust my life to you. Take me where I am and turn me in to a child of God and a member of your kingdom. And let me walk humbly alongside of you. Thank you for the promises that you give. Father, we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless.